This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, everyone. This is Andy Sutherland from the University of Virginia. And for this week's Neurology Podcast, it is my honor to be speaking with Francisca Herpich, a neurointensivist at Christiana Care in Wilmington, Delaware, for the latest installment in our Physician as Patient series. This carries over from the April 2022 Neuro Recall episode of the podcast. In the summer of 2021, shortly after completing her fellowship in neurocritical care, Dr. Herpich suffered a cryptogenic large vessel ischemic stroke with symptoms of aphasia and apraxia. Thankfully, she was seen emergently and treated with IV thrombolysis and thrombectomy and has made a remarkable recovery, allowing her to be with us today. And I'm very pleased that she's here to share some of her experiences and new perspectives. So, Franzi, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. Thank you, Andy. Very excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. I, I think for the Physician as Patient series, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for us to sort of try to experience through your own episode what it was like to have suffered a stroke. If you could take us back to that summer after fellowship, do you recall the first moment you recognized that you may be suffering a stroke and what was that like? Yeah, so it was kind of like in two stages. So first I had a TIA that I misinterpreted as a panic attack. So Two days prior to the real stroke, I was on a run and my right arm came into my field of vision and it didn't feel like my arm. It felt like something was attacking me. I was able to move it. I was able to feel it, but it just seemed like the boundaries of my body stopped before my right arm. That was a really strange feeling. With that, I also had issues with like three-dimensional vision. I had right hand dexterity issues. All this was very eerie and lasted about 10, 15 minutes or so. I'm healthy, (laughs) typically, and I just thought this is probably like a panic attack. I'm about to start my first attending job. Maybe I'm subconsciously more freaked out by what's going on. That's how it presented itself. So I didn't think too much of it. And then two days later in the morning, I went for an early morning run and that's when it actually happened. It was almost like a flip was switched. Like I remember running with my headphones and listening to music and out of a sudden, Everything went silent. And unless you've been aphasic, it's impossible to really describe the feeling. But I always compare it to the moment when you step out of a really, really noisy music hall or something. You step outside and out of a sudden everything is silent and you feel like you almost have like cotton in your ears or something. So that's what it felt like. I stopped running. And the next thing I remember was that I was like lying next to the running path and some people were trying to help me up and I kept on falling down and they were talking to me and they were trying to communicate with me and I didn't understand what they were saying. Obviously, like in hindsight, I know I was globally aphasic in that moment, but in that point in time, I was like utterly unconcerned, honestly, about what was going on. I was just like embarrassed about this entire situation. And yeah, they called an ambulance and I remember in the ambulance, the paramedic was like showing me my phone and I knew it was my phone and I knew he wanted me to unlock it so he can get some collateral information. But I had absolutely no idea how to unlock my phone. And, you know, thinking back, this was like classic idiomotor apraxia, which often comes together with aphasia. So it was quite a crazy feeling to have had. And it's almost a little bit embarrassing to say, but the moment I actually realized I had a stroke was when my receptive component of the aphasia got much better. And the resident in the emergency room told me before that, I honestly had no idea what was going on. I knew something was up, but I've never thought it was a stroke. It was like almost, almost like it was like anastognosia. I don't know, but it was like, I really had no idea. Amazing. You know, you think that you see enough stroke patients and certainly you did during your training that you would easily recognize that in your own self. But yes, you do wonder whether it is a higher cortical agnosia, but it's so instructive to hear you share that experience, you know, because as a as someone who knows as much about how these symptoms should present as as anyone likely at, at your level of training at that point, it's still difficult to fully appreciate. And I think it probably for us as providers, when our patients are having a hard time recognizing their signs and symptoms or their family members, or it just really speaks to the challenge of that at the point of diagnosis at that hyperacute point of diagnosis. So, so you realize, you know, you're having a stroke, the ED resident is let you in 
on that as your aphasia improves. And so as we alluded to before, it sounds like you were able to get there in a pretty timely fashion and be eligible for, for revascularization therapy. Yeah, I got both IV thrombolysis and then they flew me off to like a thrombectomy capable center right away. Wow. Can you take us back from that hyperacute period of time to while you're in the ICU or in the post thrombectomy, post thrombolysis, post thrombectomy period of care and maybe walk us through how things transition from that initial acute period of treatment into the recovery period? What was that sort of those initial days of hospitalization like for you as you work towards rehab? I have to be honest, the hospital stay is kind of a daze for me. Like it was like all so unreal for me. And I had a really hard time wrapping my head around like what's going on. Like how did I end up there? I was really, really fatigued in these early um, days. Uh, I had a terrible headache for whatever reason. So everything was something that I've never expected before, like experienced before. I remember that the frequent neuro exam that patients that undergo IV thrombolysis or mechanothrombectomy have to undergo were really, really challenging for me. You get woken up every hour. You don't get any rest. You don't sleep. That certainly made my fatigue and my headaches much worse. And noise coming from either the IV pump or the TV was like unbearable for me. Like I just knew that my brain needed some quiet, like it needed to rest in order to to recover. And I have to say that it was a really challenging for me to be in the hospital and these like, obviously I needed to be in the hospital, but um, it was really, really hard. It was really hard for me. I just needed to be quiet, needed to have it quiet, but it was, it was difficult initially. And navigating the hospital stay, especially when you're like expressively aphasic is quite tricky. It was like during the COVID times, visiting hours were quite restricted. So not having someone there with you to talk for you was very difficult. I remember, and I always like talk about this little anecdote, how this lady comes into the room that wanted to take my food order for the next day. Obviously, I wasn't able to read the menu. And at that point, I was a vegetarian. And saying vegetarian is really difficult <laughs> when you are facing. <laughs> and after a while, she just like slowly stepped out of the room, uh, backtracking. And the next morning, I had like a beef patty on my breakfast tray. So it's just really tricky um, when you can't express yourself, when you can't communicate. So it's very hard. You know, I think those are the little things we probably take for granted when we're trying to help someone through the recovery, particularly for aphasia, that we're thinking about the big picture. Can they go back to work? Can they communicate with their family? But, you know, something as mundane as trying to order the appropriate lunch and the entire communicative experience uh, is obviously affected. Do you, I'm curious, you know, what point did the aphasia begin to improve or did you recognize that it was improving and how long did that occur? And, and what was that like for you as you began to reaccumulate your language abilities? It improved quite quick. So on the first day, the aphasia cards, when you have to name certain objects. So on the first day, I was maybe able to get 50% of them right. And of those 50% were in German, like English is my second language. So I had a hard time with English as well. So it was quite devastating at that point. So I was absolutely unable to have a conversation or even like a sentence was impossible. And then over the next couple of days, really, I started to be able to say sentences and over maybe a week or two, it became longer sentences and paragraphs. And yeah, it continued to improve day by day. Very interesting what you noted there and the experience of aphasia and people that are bilingual. And it sounds like that, that that was consistent in your case, that your your primary original language, German, you were able to rely on that some, even though the aphasia was affecting your English severely. Is that, did you see a, a difference there? Does that sort of hold fast to what we observe in other multilingual aphasic patients in your experience? Yeah, it's a good question. I feel like it honestly affected both English and German the same way. What I did notice was the speech apraxia, like the difficulties making certain sounds. That was much more affected in English, certainly way more affected in English. I remember trying to say the word rash and it would just not come out. Like I kept on saying it ras because those sounds are just not prominent in, in German. So that's why I, I guess I had a difficult time saying those. That's a really interesting point that it's the, in some ways, the difference in the language is based on the kind of sounds you have to make the phonation. Maybe as much of an issue with 
as you point out, speech apraxia that is, is about word acquisition and grammar, shared grammar. That's really fascinating, Franzi. So the obvious question that I want to talk about and, and I think is important in all the physician as patient series that we do is, is how this experience has sort of shaped your perspective as a neurologist and neurointensivist. And the sheer fact that you mentioned the annoyances of all the, the bells and whistles going off in the hospital room, for instance, as someone who now works in an ICU, what kind of advice would you give for your colleagues, particularly our students and trainees who are who are taking care of stroke patients? As I said, the frequent neuro exams are quite taxing on your stroke patients to try to recover. So I always try to space them out as soon as I can, as soon as it's appropriate for the patient. I try to team up with a nurse so they have to do one exam rather than like two exams back to back. The noise was like a huge issue for me. So when I walk into a room and the patient is like barely awake and the TV is blasting, I turn it off or at least I ask them, do you actually want the TV on? And if they don't, I turn it off. The other thing, and I'm certainly at fault for doing that myself as well, especially before the stroke, is when you're phasic, people tend to talk to you in a really loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like almost like a reflex, but aphasics are not deaf. Like, you know, the, the hearing is okay. And I still catch myself doing that, believe it or not. So, so I always try to keep the volume at a normal, normal rate. <laughs> and the same thing goes along the same lines, really. Like often people talk to you as if you're a child, but I want to stress that people that are aphasics are still the same person. And I was like still laughing about the same situations that I would have laughed at before. I was like interpreting my own CT perfusion scan. So the person is still in there. The intelligence is like absolutely unaffected. So just try to bear this in mind. And one thing that I also experienced that physics might not be able to read texts, but they can read faces and they can interpret tonation. So when people were doing like three-step commands for me and I got it wrong and I saw the pity on their faces, I really felt demoralized for that. And now when this happens to me and I'm the doctor, I mean, I keep a smile on my face. Like there's no point in demoralizing them, right? They're going to get better and always keep a smile on your face, always keep a positive tonation in your voice. And that's what I try keep a positive attitude. That's a great pearl as well. The fact that patients with aphasia have intact prosody and emotionality of language compared, for instance, to folks with right hemispheric strokes who may have intact fluency, but they can have an expressive aprosodia or receptive aprosodia where it's harder for them to recognize those sort of nonverbal cues, emotional cues. But good to remember for all of us taking care of our aphasic patients. In fact, you know, we, we, we love the podcast. We want it to be something where someone can learn something and immediately apply to practice. I think I'm going to go back to rounds after this podcast, and I'm going to try not to yell at patients in my Southern accent uh, that are aphasic. So, Franzi, thank you for that. That's definitely something we can all learn from at the bedside. Well, again, I feel like we could extend this podcast much longer. I want to leave one opportunity here at the end for you to, what else, if anything, do you think is really important to share about your experience, both at the time of and then since with your recovery? Anything else you would like to leave our listeners with as we wrap the podcast up? The final thought is kind of cliche, but it's still so important that kindness and patience is so, so, so important. Throughout my entire acute stroke experience, like everyone was like incredibly kind to me, to my partner, to my friends. And that really means the world to the patient. And it's not just, you know, the, the patient, it's also the family that's there. And it's like a life-changing event for everyone involved, including the family. And be patient with them, be kind to them. And it makes the world of a difference to them. And just never forget that. It's really, really difficult sometimes in the hectic hospital life. But try to remind yourself that makes a huge difference for your patient. Well, I think that's a great place to really put a pin on it. Franzi, and I think that our folks that have listened to the other physician as patient episodes, including the one uh, interviewing the founder of this podcast, Ted Burns, uh, really focus on that that component of kindness with patients, and and that certainly is a shared experience across the spectrum, and and seems easy enough as we're discussing it here, but we all know, and and again, our residents and students are most prone to busy schedules and and seeing lots of patients and high throughput and 
the stress of getting additional consults and so forth, but we all should should really try to, to maintain that imperative kindness with our patients and patients and, and, and not just them, but their family and caregivers and loved ones as well. So I cannot thank you enough for sharing all of this, but I think the main thing that we're all excited about is, is that this fantastic recovery you've made, that you're back in the saddle and practicing neurocritical care and and able to, to both share your experiences with us, but also with the patients that you're seeing every day, Franzi. So thanks so much for joining us for the Neurology Podcast and this latest installment of the Physicians Patient Series. Thank you, Andy. True pleasure. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.